Today, we are gonna be working with one of my patients going through the casting process for a blow knee prosthesis or a transtibial prosthesis. If you are able to get a good cast in the beginning, that will make everything else easier. You're gonna have a better fitting check socket and ultimately a better fitting definitive prosthesis. This patient I've worked with for a couple years now and one question that I sometimes get from patients is how long is this socket gonna last me? When am I gonna need a new one? How many sockets am I gonna need in my lifetime? And that is a really hard question to answer, but just for reference for this patient, we got him his first prosthesis in May of 2019. He got a socket replacement February of 2020, so about nine months later. And just over a year and a half later, um, you know, we're in the end of October. Now we were doing a second replacement socket. So this will be his third socket in total. Part of the reason for the socket replacement, he's been getting a lot of redness recently right below that kneecap and right at the distal end at that cut end of the bone of his tibia and you can see how prominent that distal anterior tibia is some atrophy some muscle loss it's going to happen regardless but this is one reason why i'm always educating my patients to be actively squeezing their muscles while they're walking, especially initially, and preventing some of that atrophy that happens over time. So liner goes on first, we're just casting over his existing liner, and then casting sock goes over that. Locking his chair down so I don't push him back while I'm doing all this. Now, I usually don't mark up the sock that much, but I am marking it to show you kind of the anatomical landmarks that I'm paying attention to. So first of all, you have your patella, that's your kneecap. So I'm feeling the bottom, the shape of the side and the top of it as well, how broad it is. I'm also feeling for, cause you have your quad muscles up here and the tendon of those muscles attach right below your kneecap. So you can actually feel that. And I'm putting my thumbs on either side of that tendon. I'm also feeling along the crest of the tibia Along with that distal anterior tib, it's kind of like when you're feeling it, it's almost like a teardrop shape. So I'm just noting, you know, how broad it is, how prominent it is, if it has a beveled edge or a sharp edge and keeping those things in mind. Also, I am feeling, so you have the broad tibia, which is that main bone down the center of your lower leg. And then you have a smaller bone that goes down the side called the fibula. So I'm feeling for, on the side here, the fibular head, which is the, the top of the fibula, fibula where it joins with the tibia. Most of the time that's not an issue, but sometimes it is really prominent. When it comes to the fibula, I also am checking to make sure that it is cut shorter than the tibia. Sometimes the surgeon just leaves the fibula head or they'll leave a short extension of the fibula. Sometimes they'll connect the fibula to the tibia. The main thing is you just don't want that fibula to be at the same length or longer than the tibia, which I have seen. And I'm also paying attention to the condyles at the knee, just so I have an idea of proximal trim lines and proximal shape at the top of the socket. So this patient is a left. I'm always going to be wrapping into the inside of the leg, inside to the medial tibial flare, and that just helps accentuate that shape. It's also going to help move tissue around. So where his fibular head is over here, that helps give it just inherent relief. So when I start to roll, I start kind of matching what I think my final trim lines will look like. And once you get all wrapped, you're just massaging everything in. I'm using this area of my palm to do that medial shape. And then with this guy, I was able to take first two fingers to get in that interosseous space in between the tibia and his fibula. And you can see, was able to get that nice triangle type shape that we're looking for. 
So I'm having my two thumbs at in, on either side of that tendon, and then the rest of my fingers are on that flattening this posterior area. As the cast is setting up, I will ask the patient to flex through his full range of motion and then relax. And that's for two things. First of all, your patella, your kneecap moves a little bit as you're straightening out your leg and bending your leg. And so having, moving the patient through that range of motion just helps capture a better shape at the patella. Also, it helps delineate my posterior trim. So you have the medial tendon and the lateral tendon. So this medial tendon on the inside is typically gonna be a little bit lower and need a little bit more relief than the lateral side. I'm having my fingers at that diagonal so that I can feel them as they're going through that range of motion and setting my posterior trim and making sure there's that relief for those tendons. Before taking the cast off, you're compressing tissue, you're manipulating tissue, it has to go somewhere. Typically, it's gonna be proximally. You see, I'm just kind of taking my fingers and kind of cupping up at the top to just kind of bring that in a little bit so I don't have as much space during the check socket fitting and just have a better proximal shape, better shape at the top of the socket. And during the cast, sometimes with patients, I do have to cue them throughout the casting process to keep their leg as relaxed as possible to get a better cast. And there we have it. And so we'll get this scanned and sent off and uh, we'll be fitting his check socket next week. Let me know down below um, what you think or if you have any questions and I will catch you guys next time.